Joey Logano and William Byron made more comments from their incident at Darlington and were very close to potentially getting a new manufacturer in NASCAR. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We've got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show them those really quickly. We're going to start our paint schemes and sponsorship news first. Let's jump into those really, really quickly. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ty Majeski's 2022 Road Ranger scheme that we're going to see this weekend in Texas and a couple other races this season. It's really awesome to see that Ty Majeski has continued to pick up sponsorship. That's one thing Ty Majeski really struggled with last year and previous years is a lack of these fact that he's really struggled with sponsorship over the years. But it is amazing to see that he has a new sponsor that's willing to work with him. And I think the paint scheme does look really, really good. And I'm looking forward to seeing on the racetrack here this weekend at Texas. Next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Jack Wood's 2022 Seb win scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Texas and I think a couple other races as well. It is really, really good to see that Jack Wood has another sponsor that's going to be willing to work with him this season. Jack Wood is a guy that really doesn't struggle with funding. The only issue is his performance. He's got to work on that performance, but it is good to see that Jack Wood has a sponsor willing to work with him and we're hoping to see the car on the racetrack this weekend at Texas. And the final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Brendan Poole's 2022 American Scroll Scheme that we see this weekend in the Xfinity Series race at Texas. Really awesome to see that Brendan Poole's back in the 47 for My Karma Racing. Also really awesome that My Karma Racing is back this weekend for the Xfinity Series. But I think paint scheme does look really, really solid. I think it does look really, really good. And I'm absolutely looking forward to seeing the racetrack here this weekend at Texas. I'm really excited for it, and I'm glad to see they'll be back this weekend at Texas. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're talking about Austin Dillon. As there was a bill on Friday evening, Austin Dillon has a new TV reality show coming to USA starting on June 23rd. It's going to be 30-minute tape shows, and it will be it's called Austin Dillon's Life in the Fast Lane. I love that Austin Dillon is going out and doing something different, not just focusing on racing, but having a reality TV show. But the difference is, unfortunately, from him compared to guys like Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott, Austin Dillon does not have as big of a resume. Yes, of course, he's an Xfinity and Truck Series champion, but he has doesn't have as big of a resume in the Cup Series side of things as those guys have. So are people going to watch Austin Dillon's show? I really don't know. Of course, maybe some people are going to watch it, but I really don't think a lot of people are going to watch the show as they think they're going to. I do like, though, he isn't something that's coming out that's much different. I think that's really, really exciting, though, but I'm not sure if people are going to watch it, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson, like always, went out and did some dirt racing this past week and did some dirt late model racing at Charlotte Raceway. He did not win on night one, but on night two, Kyle Larson put up a dominating clinic and won $25,000 and won the Colossal 100 at the Charlotte Dirt Track. It does not matter what series Kyle Larson gets into. Kyle Larson can win on dirt lane models. He can win in spring cars. He can win in cup series cars. Not as much this year, but he can win on any type of cars. Next gen cars. It doesn't matter what series he gets into. Kyle Larson can go out there and win races. And that's why he's one of the best. Had also amazing and incredible save this past weekend at Kansas in the Cup Series. So it's really awesome to see that Kyle Larson was able to get it done. Good to see that. I'm glad to see that Kyle Larson was able to pick up the victory in the Colossal 100. I think that's really, really awesome, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Ford. Now, I went and did some research this morning on Ford because I was sent a tidbit that Ford all failed to finish in the top 10 in this race. And I had to check if the results is true or not. And sure enough, Ford, for the first time in a long time, they failed to finish in the top 10. The last time that Ford failed to have any car finish in the top 10 was the 2015 Good Headache Relief Shop 500 at Martinsville. Everyone knows about the race. That's the situation between Matt Kenseth and Joey Logano when Matt Kenseth reached a boiling point. And I think Ford generally has been struggling here over the last couple weeks. Yes, I know this past weekend they did, a week or two ago they wanted Darlington, but generally in the truck series at least they're doing great, but this weekend they generally struggle. Now Ryan Blaney almost got a top 10 this weekend, nearly scored a top 10, same with Austin Center. But it's just crazy to think that it's been seven, almost seven years since the last time Ford had any cars finishing the top 10. I think Ford's got some work to do on their aero program. Yes, they were having some cars that were running well, but they just did not get the finishes. So what this tells me is that Ford definitely has to work on their program just a little bit. If they can do that, I definitely believe they've got a shot at contending a lot more, but it's definitely frustrating to see that they were not able to have a great run, to be honest with you. Hopefully they can get that turnaround in the future for Ford. 
And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Darren Diddley. As it was revealed out of nowhere that Darren Diddley is going to be making his Xfinity Series debut in a couple weekends at Portland, driving the number 38 for RSS Racing. I really don't have much information on Darren Diddley. I think he's competing in the Trans Am Series and has one win in the Trans Am Series. If I'm not mistaken, I think he's a much old. I'm not sure how old Darren Dilley is. He may be a young driver. He may be an older driver. I'm not really sure, but this is going to be his NASCAR debut, whereas it's a Cup Series, Finney Series, or Truck Series. This is going to be his debut. My expectations really aren't high. I think he is a road course specialist, but like I said, my expectations are not really high for Darren Dilley. <clears throat> my hope and prayer for Darren Dilley is he can get behind the wheel and do really, really good in his 38 car. Hope he does great, and I'm glad to see we got a new guy coming to series. I just don't know how he's going to do and fair, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk Travis McCauley. As Travis McCauley is going to be making his truck series debut in that couple weeks at Sonoma, driving the number 46 for Glory to God Racing. Travis McCauley, I don't know exactly what series he's competing in. I don't know if he's competing in IMSA. I don't know exactly what series, whether it's Trans Am. I don't really know. But I think it's really awesome that he's getting an opportunity to compete in the truck series. He's not really competing in a fast truck, though. That's the thing. The Glory to God Racing trucks have generally been really, really slow. So you cannot generally have really high expectations for the Glory to God Racing organization. If he does well this weekend, I think that's great for him and great for his experience. But my expectations are not through the roof. That being said, though, I do think it's awesome he's getting another opportunity versus ever opportunity in the truck series. Maybe if he does well enough, he'll get some more starts. I'm not entirely sure, but really awesome to see that he's going to be making his truck series debut in Glory to God Racing. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about winners so far throughout the season. So, in the first 13 races through the first half of this year, we've had 11 drivers who've won in the first 13 races of the season. This is the only second time in Cup Series history that that has happened. It's, of course, supported by Joseph Strigley. That year being 2003, year that Matt Kenseth went on to win the championship. There have been so many guys that won this year. And one of the biggest questions is, are we going to see more than 16 winners in the regular season for the playoffs? And I think there is a very strong possibility, especially with these stats, I think there is a very strong possibility that this honestly could happen, especially of how strong the field is and the guys that have not won this year. So far, all the Hender guys have won. Two of the Joe Gibbs cars have won. One of the 2311 cars has won. Uh, it's just been incredible to watch here. Also, one of the, two of the Team Penske guys have won this year. And I think it just shows a couple things. One, parity is throughout the field. They were talking to the next gym was well, going to bring a lot of parity. And so far, it's great. And you really think about the guys who still are winless so far this year. You got Ryan Blaney, who's the highest up of points of guys who have not won this year. Martin Trick Jr., Christopher Bell, those guys honestly could win. Both of the RCR cars, Tyler Reddick and Austin Dillon. Daniel Suarez could win a race this year. You've got some outsiders like Bubba Walsh, which we'll get him hint into him later in this episode. And we got a lot of the drivers that are still looking for that first win of 2022. And I think this year, unlike past years, I think it's very likely that we're going to have more than 16 winners. Especially if we get a 12th winner this weekend, when we go to, not this weekend, but next weekend, we go to the Coke 600. I think it's a very strong possibly we could have a 16 winner. So we'll have to keep our eyes on that for sure. But it's amazing to see that we could tell, potentially have 16 different winners this season. I think that'd be really, really great. And hopefully it does happen for them in the future. Maybe we'll see 16 different winners here in the future. And now we're going into on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Mark Miles. Now, Mark Miles kind of was not very happy with Greg Moffey's comments here that he made at the Miami GP talking about the Indy 500 TV coverage is not as good as F1's coverage. Mark Miles really disagreed with Liberty Media's CEO, Greg Moffey, as reported by Adam Stern. Assessment that Sky Sports F1 coverage trumps NBC Sports Indy 500 coverage. And he spoke to Moffey in recent days to question, why Moffy suggested that publicly. Now, <clears throat> of course, when I saw this report, I really did not discuss this. But I will say both IndyCar and F1 do have better coverage than NASCAR, generally on a week-by-week -week basis. But here's the thing about Formula 1 compared to IndyCar. I think IndyCar does have pretty good coverage. I think they do have much better coverage than some aspects than NASCAR. But I will say Formula 1, when it comes to racing coverage in the United States, I think Formula One does have better coverage. Yes, of course, Sky Sports does run it, which, of course, are from the UK. They do run a lot of promotion and spend millions and millions of dollars on their coverage. Compared to IndyCar, that probably doesn't spend as much. But one thing those series do have in common is both of them do. You actually do get to see all the action in the race, and you don't really miss a ton of the action 
during the green flag of the race. F1, though, does not have commercials at all in their races, and that's one thing Formula 1, I think, does a little bit better than IndyCar does. But I will say the Indy 500 coverage is not as bad as they're making it out to be, but I understand Mark Miles' frustrations, and I also understand why Gray Moffey's come from, too. Both series, though, are in a much better position when it comes to coverage than other series, and I think that's one thing they should absolutely focus on compared to other series, to be honest with you. And now we're going to move on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about an IndyCar documentary. It was reported by Adam Stern on Saturday. The IndyCar is on the 10-yard line to strike a deal with a media company like the digital service platform to shoot a new unscripted docuseries around the open wheel racing property per CEO Mark Miles. IndyCar is working with the producer, which is handling the talks currently at the moment. I've heard about the rumors of a potential uh, docuseries for the IndyCar series, and I think a lot of the reason that IndyCar is trying to get a docuseries out there is they're trying to get it back up there and get into the graces and get more public on IndyCar. The racing IndyCar, especially over the last couple of years, has generally been really, really good, and we have one of the highest field counts in the history of IndyCar, where like 26 or 27 guys or girls are showing up on a week-by-week -week basis. It's just one thing IndyCar has been lacking compared to NASCAR and Formula One right now is they're lacking the promotion around it. A docu-series like this could really grow the sport. And yes, a lot of people are going to say, well, they may be jumping right now <laughs> on the bandwagon of trying to get into the world and trying to get basically jump on the bandwagon of the Drive to Survive series. And you might be right on that. They may be trying to jump on that. But one thing I will generally say is the fact that they are working on a docuseries I think is really, really important. And if you see a docuseries from IndyCar and it does really well like the Drive to Survive does, it can really, really grow to sport and kind of get that 18 to 49 demographic. TV providers and TV providers, like I said, generally, they like that 18 to 49 demographic. That's such an important demographic, and the younger fan base is what's going to keep your sport alive for the long term. Yes, your core fan base is also going to keep you alive for the long term, but that core that core fan base, that document, that 18 to 49 demographic is going to help you long term. So I think it's great to see they're working on a docuseries. Again, I would think maybe it's going on Netflix, maybe it's going to Amazon or Hulu, I'm not sure, but I think it's amazing that they're working on a docuseries. I think a docuseries is really, really important. And I'm very happy to see for sure they got a docuseries that's on the way <clears throat> currently at the moment. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Michael Jordan. Now, of course, this past weekend on yesterday, 2311 picked up their second victory as an organization, and Kurt Busch picked up his first victory with 2311 Racing and their first win of the 2022 season. And Michael Jordan was absolutely overjoyed and happy. He says that Kurt ran really, really great today and is happy for Kurt Busch and overall the organization of 2311 Racing. Now, it's unclear if Michael Jordan was at the track. I don't think he was. I think Denny Hamlin got on the phone with Michael Jordan, so Michael Jordan was not at the racetrack. But Michael Jordan, when it comes to him, you're expected to go out there and contend and win races. And let's be for real, 2311 this year has really, really struggled. And it's not just been the fall of 2311, their picker, which we'll talk about later, among other things, has really, really affected this team. And when you have Michael Jordan coming out and being really, really happy when your team goes to victory lane, I think that's the best feeling you can have. And your team owners, like Denny Hamlin, was very, very emotional yesterday and crying yesterday because he was so happy. And he said he never kind of felt the way he has Fox. He doesn't know how much longer he's going to be around as a driver and doesn't know if 2311 will be around for the very, very long term. He really doesn't know that. So seeing a team like 2311 racing continue to have as, as much success as they've had, I think is absolutely amazing. And see them get their second victory and their first victory. And I think they had their best race as an organization as a whole overall. But Bubba having a pretty strong run finishing in 10th and Kurt Busch winning the race, I think is great for the team, and it's great that Michael Jordan was really, really happy to see their team win, which I think having a team owner be really happy to see the team win, I think is really, really awesome, and glad to see the Bubba Walls won the race. Congratulations, not Bubba Walls, but Kurt Busch, excuse me, was able to win. Congratulations to 2311 Racing on picking up the, the victory. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about attendance in NASCAR. Now, along with many other reports, Adam Stern's reported, Adam Stern reported on Saturday that the gains were about the attendance, and he says the gains could be lost as NASCAR visits some tracks with weak attendance 
but the sanctioning body says it saw strong ticket sales to 10 during the first quarter of the 2022 season. So far, the 2022 season, generally when it comes to attendance, attendance has been much up. The Daytona 500 sold out the quickest it's ever sold out. Vegas had higher attendance. Auto Club had its highest attendance in years. Uh, Dover had its highest attendance in like five or six years. Talladega had its highest attendance since the spring of 2017. And I think generally the attendance for these races is going up. And I think there's a lot of reasons. One, people are now able to get out and enjoy the races. They're out to get in some because, it, especially with the pandemic that happened, people were not really able to get out as much. So I think people are going out. But also ticket sales for this compared to like Formula One races and IndyCar races, they're generally a lot cheaper to go to these races. So that's another big factor right there. But I also think there's a lot of energy around the sport right now with everything going on. I think a lot of people want to go see these next-gen cars go out there, the Gen 7 cars. They want to go see them race out there. And generally, the next-gen car has put on amazing racing throughout this year. I can name six or seven races or eight races right now that you probably could say are the best race of 2022. You can make an argument this past race at Kansas which is absolutely a nutty race. You can argue that this was one of the best races of the season, and it's just been such a fun season to watch. And when the racing is good, and when the crowds are as good as they are, people are going to be really energized and pumped up to go out and watch racing. That's something that's really, really important. Is yes, we're going to a lot of races that aren't expected attendance, but I can tell you one race that for sure will have big attendance, and it's a gateway race, which will be coming up here in about 20 days from today. But I can tell you, attendance is definitely in a much better position in NASCAR right now. Yes, ratings may not be, they're actually up 17 or 16% from last year as a moment. Of course, that's because the Daytona 500 happened on a traditional time compared to the times that started in the past. And basically, a three, that's 3 p.m. start times can't be anything but ain't going forward. But I think it's really awesome that attendance is going up in big ways. Again, we're going to a lot of tracks right now. Like Kansas, for instance, didn't have the greatest attendance, but there are a lot of contributing factors to why. There was a rainstorm that came through the Kansas area. I don't live too far from Kansas, so I do know basically why that we got it. In fact, we got it where I live, a lot of rain. But generally, it's amazing to see that attendance has been up for NASCAR very, very recently. I think it's great for the sport and really awesome to see that attendance was up for NASCAR. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the IndyCar GP at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Road Course. The day before the Cup Series race, which we thought that race absolutely nuts, the IndyCar Series hat went to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the Indy Road Course race to kick off the month of May. And usually the Indy Road Course races generally are not as chaotic or just generally calm, and you have a guy dominating like Reigns VK, VK did last year. Well, this race was the exception. Because of all the rain that came through the Indianapolis area throughout the day and the thunderstorms, they had to basically cancel second half of the race for the uh, Indy Lights Series. Only got 14 laps in. I think they eventually did complete it after the IndyCar race happened. But they stopped the Indy Lights race to get the IndyCar race started. This race had everything. Yeah, guys coming down pit row, basically having to change into the soft tire, basically to the slick tires. You had Colton Turner with one of the most badass saves I have ever seen in my entire life. We had some incredible saves in the racing world this weekend. This is the best IndyCar save I have ever seen. I've watched IndyCar for about eight or nine years now. Never seen an IndyCar get that sideways and basically continue driving. Colton Herta is a wheelman. You have guys getting off in the grass, championship contenders wrecking. You have guys running into each other. And at the end of the day, they all turn it into a time race. And Colton Herta, who also had an amazing save, went on because of really good strategy, getting on slicks first. He went on to win the IndyCar GP at Indianapolis Motor Speedway Road Course, picking up his first win of the 2022 season. Colin Herter has been really, really fast this season, but unfortunately for him, he's had a lot of bad luck and a lot of issues on pit road. They just haven't been as good on pit road as other teams have been. So it is amazing to see the IndyCar GP was able to be won by Colin Herter. He's getting the month of May kicked off as he looks to try to win the Indianapolis 500. We'll see how fast the pace is and speed for him, but... I think it's awesome to see that he was able to go out there and win. Congratulations to Colin Herta on picking up the IndyCar GP at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Road Course win. Congratulations to Colin Herta on picking up that victory. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about bubble walls in 2311 racing for one big reason and one big reason only. So Denny Hamlin was really, really frustrated on the radio yesterday with the pit crews for 2311 Racing. And Denny Hamlin did go to the media center later this later that evening after race. And he says that 2311 has to change and clean up the pit stops and figure out the situation 
with the pit stops. When it comes to teams that have really struggled on pit road, 20 through 11 generally for not just Kurt Busch, but for Bubba Wallace this year, have generally really, really struggled. There have been so many races this year in the last couple of years, really since last year, where I feel like Bubba Walls in 20 through 11 racing have been really, really fast and have had speed to get top fives and top tens. The same thing goes for Kurt Busch, really except this week. Kurt Busch has picked her, besides the last pit stop where they only fell back to third, they still ended up having a great race and her picker did great. But Bubba Walls' picker, man, has just an absolutely horrendous, and I know that they get their teams from Joe Gibbs Racing, but still... The fact that currently at the moment you see Bubba Walls on a week by week basis have top five and top ten speed at a lot of these races, the pit crew just absolutely shits the bed for the team, and it's really, really frustrating to watch. And when Denny Hamlin's getting frustrated on the radio, and Booty Barker is really upset too about it, there have to be major changes in the pit crews. Especially after they picked up the win, there is no reason that Bubba Walls should have finished where he did. Bud Walls had a top five car, a car that could have maybe slot, potentially competed for a man. I don't think he's as good of a car as Kurt did. But Bubba had a really great car yesterday, one of the few cars that really could drive the field. And by the way, had the most green flag passes in the race, had 123 green flag passes, which is more than any other driver can say had in this race. And I just, I feel so bad for Bubba Walls. In 2311 in general, their pit crews have been so bad this year. They've had many issues. They've had six loose wheels throughout this year. It's just been a horrendous and terrible year for 2311 on pit road. And they've got to get their situation sorted out. And it needs to happen fast. Because we're not too far from the playoffs. We're halfway through the regular season. The regular season is flying by. And they're losing more and more opportunities. They get great finishes. And they, just, they got to fit a good finish yesterday. But they got to fix the pit crews. Because it's really, really frustrating to watch. As a fan of 2311 Racing, I really feel for Bubba Wallace, and I do feel for this team. But the same token, at the same time, it's getting really, really frustrating to watch. It seems like on a week-by-week -week basis, this team cannot get their shit together, and it's really, really frustrating to watch. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to talk about Billy Venturini and his comments that he made at Drew Dollar. Now, they were, I believe, him and Corey Hine were battling for the lead, I believe, in the race where Drew Dollar was going to lap down. I'm not entirely sure. I don't exactly remember. I really didn't watch the ARCA race. Billy Venturi was not very happy. And there's a good reason for that. Drew Dollar got really, really loose into the corner, going down the straightaway, going into the corner. And Corey Hine and him both ended up wrecking and destroying their cars. Billy Venturini, like I mentioned, was pretty livid and pretty upset. He basically says that basically said Drew Dollar basically wrecks you every single week. He basically wonders why Drew Dollar got punched in the face by David Gillen, was caught criticizing him for his time at Venturini Motorsports. And then he says he's a really nice kid, but Drew Dollar should not be out on the racetrack and shouldn't be out there. And he instead should be going away to do something else for a living. I kind of have to agree here with Billy Venturini here. Yes, I know that Drew Dollar brings in a lot of funds, and a ton of money. But it's really frustrating that Drew Dollar, it seems like on a weekly -week basis, either wrecks cars, and by the way, this is a Kyle Busch Motorsports Sports car. Yes, it's not Joe Gibbs Racing, but it's a Kyle Busch Motorsports Sports car. And by the way, Sammy Smith, I believe, and maybe I'm not entirely sure not, but I think he has won a race or two in ARCA. So I don't understand how Drew Dollar is so freaking bad on a week-by-week -week basis. You're in one of the best cars. On top of that, in the truck series last year, driving for KPM, he was running 25th in a KPM truck going laps down. When that truck has contended with John Hunter Nemechek in this series, when he's contended with Chandler Smith in this series, it's just so frustrating to watch this guy. And look, I don't want to sound like I hate Drew Dollar, but this guy is so atrocious. And why? And I'm glad he's not running full-time, because if he was running full-time with that 18 car, Man, oh man, we've had some problems. I'm glad that he's only running a few races with the team. It's just so frustrating to watch because I think you've got better drivers that deserve this ride than Drew Dollar. I mean, Sammy Smith should be full-time in that car. It's just so frustrating to watch how Drew Dollar does. And Billy Venturini's on point, and people say, well, Billy Venturini's just complaining for the sake of complaining. He took out one of his cars, and Billy Venturini's won a lot of races in ARCA, so Billy Venturini has absolutely right to be really, really frustrated by it. He's the owner of the team, so he's going to be really, really frustrated by it. And I just get frustrated seeing Drew Dollar out there get outrun by drivers. He should not be getting outrun by. He's getting outrun by terrible teams, and it's just really frustrating to watch. I get why people like it, but same token at the same time, it is very frustrating to watch Drew Dollar get out there. It just seems like you're chasing hands with him, and it's just really, really frustrating to watch Drew Dollar be on the racetrack, to be perfectly honest with you. 
And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Joey Logano and William Byron. Now, Joey Logano and William Byron, we've talked about this on the channel many, many times throughout this. We talked about this twice on the channel last week. Joey Logano went on the Stack and Pennies podcast and basically said that William Byron should move on. Now, Joey Logano basically stand, said he stands by what he said and he won't get pushed around and says if Byron wants to keep going, it won't be good for him. William Byron did respond to this and basically said that it's not even between him and Joey Logano, but he currently in a moment does not plan to retaliate against Joey Logano currently at this moment. Now, for those of you who have been pay, pay, keeping up the speed, late in the race at Darlington, William Byron and Joey Logano basically were battling really hard on a late race racer. William Byron kind of crowded Joey Logano up going into turn number two, but William Byron also wasn't really, if he kind of didn't crowd him up there, he probably wasn't going to make the corner and was going to be like Ross Chastain earlier in the race. Joey Logano got into the wall. Logano's car really came to life late, and he had a much faster car than William Byron's car, as William Byron's car really started to struggle late in this race. William Byron, Joey Logano eventually caught William Byron with around two laps to go, and instead of passing William Byron Klingler having an all-time classic finish like 2003 Darlington race, Joey Logano just straight up ran into the back of William Byron and put him into the wall, and instead of William Byron winning or finishing second, he ended up having some flat tires and cross the line in 13th place. William Byron was very, very pissed off. He basically said some cuss words to Jeff Corb, then called Joey Logano an idiot and a moron, and was really, really frustrated walking back. Joey Logano basically reiterated the same comments he said today, this past weekend, basically said those same things. And then Joey Logano, like I mentioned, went on the Sack and Penny's podcast and basically said the same thing, where basically said, I'm not going to get pushed around. Now, I will give Joey Logano props. He's being very consistent with what he said. We know that Joey Logano's had a history of getting into people and having issues. And I don't know if Joey Logano knows this, and I don't know if William Byron's going to be the same way Matt Kenseth was, but Joey Logano made these very similar comments back in 2015. And does everyone know what happened to Joey Logano in 2015 in Marsville? Well, we all know what happened. We kind of talked about it earlier today on this episode. Basically, he ran into the Joe Matt Kenseth got really, really ticked off with Joey Logano after being wrecked out by teammate Brakosowski. Him knowing he's got nothing to lose because he's been eliminated from the playoffs up to this point, thanks to Logano and Kislowski's antics in the season. He runs into the back of Joey Logano, gets really, really mad, says he has a flat tire, but he really doesn't, and just straight up drives into the back of Joey Logano and destroys Joey Logano's car. Matt Kenseth gets a two race suspension. And Joey Logano should know that he probably should talk. And, said that, and I'm not sure William Byron is going to be that same way. But in my opinion, when it still comes to the situation, I kind of stand by what I've said throughout this week. Joey Logano really is at fault for the situation. And look, I'm glad that Joey Logano is being consistent. And I'm glad he's trying to basically play that villain card. I love the fact that he's trying to play it. But he's kind of a second standard guy. And we've seen Joey Logano get frustrated with guys at hard racing. We know that he got really mad at uh, Chase Elliott in 2020 at Bristol. And look, it was really Chase's fault, clearly. But Chase Elliott got mad and basically Logano said, just show some respect out there. But Joey Logano over the years hasn't really shown respect. And I think that's why guys have generally not shown overall the most respect to guys like Joey Logano. They really haven't shown respect. I also do think at the same time, I don't think Joey Logano really entirely cares that P's out there, he's not really out there to make friends. He's out there, go out there and win a championship and win races. And that's very respectful that he's trying to go out there and win races and contend for a championship. And you gotta respect at least respect for that, that he's trying to go out there and race hard. But he's again, he and the other thing too is that he probably would not have done this at all to William Byron if he knew if basically William Byron never had been put in the position. William Byron has now a basically is at a career crossroads right now because he can decide do I really race Joe Logano hard and have my Chase Elliott moment or do I basically pull a Matt Kenseth? I think if you're good William Byron, I think you're going to see him race Joe Logano a lot harder. We didn't really see both of them race each other at Kansas. And the big question is currently at the moment, are we going to see William Byron have any retaliation to Joe Logano throughout the season? Are we going to see multiple instances? Or are we going to see a big moment happen like 2015 Matt, 15 when Matt Kenseth ran into Joe Logano? Or are we going to see that big incident happen? That's one thing we're going to have to watch throughout the season is if Joe Logano gets wrecked by, by him and is Joe Logano get really, really mad about it. Because if Joe Logano basically gets mad, mad, mad at William Byron wrecked him, you kind of wrecked William Byron for no reason, dude. And Logano is known to be like that. And another thing, Joe Logano, you probably can learn, is how Kurt Busch and Kyle Larson race at the end of the race. Kurt got into the crowd Kyle Larson just a little bit. I really don't think he intentionally did. Kurt crowded Kyle Larson up to the outside wall. 
And Kyle Larson wasn't even mad. He basically said it's hard racing. We're going for the women eight laps to go. <clears throat> and Kyle Larson was not mad. Kyle Larson could have been really, really frustrated that he lost an opportunity to win. But instead, Kyle Larson wasn't really pissed off. He wasn't really frustrated about it. And you got to respect Kyle Larson for that. He knows how hard racing is. He hasn't really been mad at any drivers over the years. I haven't seen Kyle Larson the most angry at drivers over the years. I know the one time he wrecked Justin Haley for just hard racing. But I think it just shows that Kyle Larson is a much better driver than most than Joe Lagana at the moment right now. But I don't know what will happen between these two. We see more issues between these two going forward. I kind of hope we get eventually done talking about this until we have more incidents with them. But this is something that's going to be talked about throughout the year. So we've had so many drivers basically have issues against each other throughout the year. So we'll wait to see what has between us two. But I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen here going forward, to be perfectly honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're going to talk about new manufacturers. Now, last week on the channel, we talked about what happened. On, we Kelly Crandall had her podcast with Steve O'Donnell. And Adam Stern kind of touched up on that in a report this past weekend. So we talked about how there potentially could be a new manufacturer that could be jumping into the NASCAR Cup Series or NASCAR in general. And basically reiterated, see Adam Stern tweeted as well, the NASCAR COO says a new OEM is close to the finish line about joining the sport. Now, we've talked about this over on this channel many, many times, that there has been a lot of talk about, really since about last year, so really about like the last couple years, there's been rumors of a new manufacturer who could be coming in to the NASCAR Cup Series. Now, currently right now, there are no plans for 2023 and 2024, but the rumor right now is that this new manufacturer could come in as early as 2025 when the new engine package comes in, and I think that's why these talks are getting wrapped up. Now, who are the current favorites to potentially get in there? I'll talk really quickly before I jump into that. Basically, I just want to talk about this. Adam Stern got a lot of backlash for the tweet because Kelly Crandall's, but it really wasn't his fault. It's essentially sports, which has done a lot of clickbait. That's one thing to you know. But back to it, what manufacturers are probably the favorites currently at the moment? Obviously, you've got Kia could be a favorite currently at the moment right now. Kia's got a growing brand. I know Kia's had some conversations about getting in the world of racing. They could be a manufacturer that's in talks there. Honda's another manufacturer. This is one I think that could be a major, major possibility for NASCAR. Honda, of course, we're currently races in F1 with Red Bull and Toro Rosso. Not Toro Rosso, uh, Alpha Tauri. They also do have, of course, have IndyCar, where they basically have many, many teams there. And they also could be in other forms of racing as well across the world. Maybe Hyundai could be a potential brand to go there. Hyundai, of course, is a growing brand in the world of racing at the moment. That's another team, a manufacturer, that'd be coming into play. Maybe somehow Tesla comes into sport. I know that NASCAR is looking for electric components when it comes to new engine package. Maybe Tesla comes in in the future. Who knows? But I will tell you right now which manufacturer that I think is going to be the manufacturer that I think is going to come into NASCAR. It's going to be Dodge. And I'll tell you why it's going to be Dodge. We've talked about Dodge on this channel many, many times about Dodge returning to NASCAR. Really started hearing these rumors really back in November and December. And it started when Steve Phelps had his state of the sport address after the at the end of Phoenix during, I think, the Friday at Phoenix, talking about the future of NASCAR, among many other things. Talk about a lot of tidbits. But the main tidbit that came out was that there was a manufacturer basically said that they were talking to Dodge or not talking to Dodge, basically talked to Dodge. And many people in the industry believe that it's going to be Dodge. Now, Dodge has not been in NASCAR since 2012, the last time we were in 2012. They actually were supposed to be around in 2013, and they were supposed to part up, and Andretti Oz were supposed to come over, and they were supposed to have Kurt Busch and Matt Kenseth drive those cars in 2013. That's why Kurt Busch in 2014 drove for Andretti Autosport in the Indianapolis 500, because he had those ties and connections, and was supposed to drive for them in 2013, but that never came through, and they never got the production of the Dodge ready to go. They had tested, but they hadn't gotten ready to go. There's another big reason why I think that this will be the manufacturer. Tony Stewart and Stewart Haas Racing. Now, this is something we've talked about many, many times, but there are, if there's what teams are going to make the move over right if Dodge comes back, and obviously I think Tony Stewart and Stewart Haas Racing are the clear favorites to make that move over. Tony Stewart and Tony Stewart Racing are partnered up with Dodge in the NHRA right now, and they've had some, quite a bit of success so far in the NHRA. I think they've won a couple of races in the NHRA this year with Leah Pruitt, and uh, I don't remember the other guy that's on the team. Basically, both their guys have went out there and won races so far this season, and they've Matt Hagen is who it is. They've been really, really successful so far. So you have to think about that. Also, Tony Stewart doesn't get as much support from Ford as they used to. Yes, they've had a much better year this year than last year, but you look at how bad they performed last year, they weren't as good. 
Also, Tony Stewart, I'm not sure if he really has these tensions or not, but Tony Stewart may still be frustrated with Ford because he couldn't let Kyle Larson come over to the series. They wanted to have Kyle Larson drive for Stuart Haas Racing in the 2021 season, but Ford basically did not budge. That's why Kyle Larson <coughs> did go over to Hendrick. Eventually, I think Larson was going to go to Hendrick anyways because he had been the favorite before the situation happened last year. He was a favorite to go there, but then he has major, major incident. The other thing, though, and another big reason is I think of the teams that are really, really possible making the boot. Right? you got Joe Gibbs with Toyota. You've got Team Penske with Ford and Hendrick with Chevy. Suros Race, which I think is probably the fourth best organization, would make a lot of sense to be at Dodge. Now, they would not be the only team that I think would make the move over to Dodge if the Dodge does come in. I think Rick Ware Racing would be the other team. Now, Rick Ware Racing is not competing in the Penny Series this year, but guess what manufacturer they ran in the Penny Series last year? They ran with Dodges. Dodges in the Penny Series. So they obviously would be a great choice right there. And, of course, Rick Ware does have a technical alliance with Sewer Haas Racing. So I think if Dodge does come back to NASCAR, I think it's going to be Sewer Haas Racing, and I think it's going to be Rick Ware Racing. That's going to be the main teams that make the jump over to Dodge. So, anyway, that's today's long NASCAR and motorsports video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and notification on to be notified when a video does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Ask for me on pages. I'll list you above over that. Comment your thoughts on today's episode. Will you, do you think any manufacturer is going to be in the near future? And so, which teams do you think switch over and what manufacturer comes in? Let me know in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about Joe Lugano, William Byron's food? And do you think it continues going into later this year? Let me know in the comments below. Tomorrow on my channel, we're going to be having race picks for the all Straits on my channel. And then throughout the rest of the week, we're going to have some NASCAR news content on this channel. And we're also going to have another special product that should be out here in the future. I don't know what it's going to be, but I should have something out coming out this Thursday. So anyway, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video. And I'll see you guys next time some more great, awesome NASCAR and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.